Chapter 10. The Cowboy Sees the World. Tom didn't get back from Japan until May 1, 1981. He not only managed to finish the tour, but he stole the show. He worked on live TV with a small, sensational masked wrestler, Satoru Sayama, known as Tiger Mask. Between the two of them they set new standards of fast-paced, high-flying razzle-dazzle. Shima not only gave Tom a nice fat bonus and booked him for more tours, but he also paid him in cash for his knee surgery, which Tom then had done for free in Canada. Compared to the rest of us, Tom was rich. A few days after Tom got home, Julie and I looked out the front window as a not-quite-new olive green Eldorado pulled up in front of our place. Out stepped Michelle decked in black leather boots that came to mid-high and a mini skirt. She was growing up fast. Tom's cousin Davy had arrived from England and was staying at Tom's place. When Michelle told me that Tom was shoe-flying Davy and all he did was run to the toilet, I knew that I had to go rescue him. Davy was a shy, skinny, simple-hearted kid with big dimples. Only 18 years old and lucky if he was 170 pounds, he was handsome, I could see why Diana gushed all over his pictures. His first mistake was assuming Tom would treat him like a little brother. When I got over to Tom's place I told him that Stu wanted Davy to stay with me since he and his cousin would be working together, and they needed to kayfabe. That Sunday all the wrestlers played a charity baseball game with a local radio station in exchange for a couple of free plugs. Tom explained it as best he could to Davy, it's, erm, like rounders, backs, calling the kid by his childhood nickname, short for Baxter. Tom, not surprisingly, played well while seemingly not even trying. Davy blindly struck out every time up. It would have been hard not to notice Diana cheering him on from the bleachers, and when he glanced up at her as he came up to bat the next time, I realized he really didn't want to strike out in front of her. Davy looked down at the bats lined up on the grass, unsure which to choose. Bruce raised an eyebrow and in an encouraging voice said, Why don't you try one of these left-handed bats, Davy? As if there was a difference because of the way they were facing. Davy grabbed one of the bats, thinking he finally had the right one, marched up to the batter's box and blasted the first pitch out of the park. As he rounded third grinning from ear to ear, he yelled in amazement, it was the fucking bat the whole time. That was just how Davy Boy was. But one thing was for sure, you only had to show him how to do something a couple of times for him to get the hang of it. He was an excellent athlete and a fast learner. Now that he was living with me, his weight was coming up, and he was smiling all the time. This naive little kid from Northern England had found a home. Hey Brett, he said after the game, I'm going to catch a lift with your sister, Diana. At the end of May, Davy Boy was to wrestle Dynamite for the World Mid Heavyweight title in Regina. Though Davy was living with me, Tom had earned Davy's trust by giving him some old gear he didn't need anymore. And as the days had gone by and Davy saw what his cousin could do in the ring, he was more and more in awe of him. Sometime during that month, Tom also turned Davy onto steroids. Tonight, Tom decided it was Davy's time to get some juice. Davy said, I've never done it before. Tom blew him off like it was no big deal. Fook. I'll do ya. You'll not feel a thing, just a pin prick. I pulled Davy aside and said, never let anyone cut you, ever. Do it yourself, or don't do it at all. This business is all about trust, and you can't trust him. Davy went back to Tom and told him I said he shouldn't do it. When they both came to me, I reluctantly told them it was up to them. Davy looked back and forth between us. Finally he said to Tom, you won't hurt me, right? I watched them from the back wall by the dressing room door. They were fantastic together. Davy, also taught by Ted Betley, had already picked up a lot of Tom's moves, and they were bursting into beautiful English-style routines, leaping and diving over and under each other until Dynamite stopped Davy cold with a stiff knee in the gut. He tossed Davy out of the ring, ran him into the wall not ten feet away from me, reached into his trunks and pulled out wrestling's newest novelty item, a scalpel blade. When Davy rightfully panicked, Tom grabbed him in a chokehold, and with Davy fighting and squirming to get away, he drove the blade into Davy's head, cutting him to the bone. Davy jerked to one side and the blade sliced halfway around the top of his skull. It looked like someone poured a bucket of thick red paint over his head. I was certain that without immediate medical attention, he'd bleed to death. I dashed over and threw Davy's arm over my shoulder, first running with him and then carrying him the short distance to Pasqua Hospital. The familiar doctor hurried to stitch him up, asking in a disgusted tone how it happened. Davy started telling him about brass knucks, but I cut him off with the truth. The wrestler he worked with took a razor blade and tried to cut the top of his head off. In the van on the way home, Tom and Davy sat together drinking beer. You shouldn't have fucking moved, Bax. Tom said. Sorry, Tom. The simple truth is, Tom got away with a lot because he was good for business. 
Stu was the longest still active member of the NWA, having signed up back in 1948, but nevertheless at the end of May that year, he got a call from the organization informing him that their newly crowned champion Dusty Rhodes couldn't be spared for Stu's annual Stampede show. Needless to say, Stu was disappointed, he'd always got the champion before. But he put in a call to Vern Gagne and booked the AWA world champ, Nick Bockwinkel, instead. Schultz should have been the one to take on Bockwinkel, but he argued that it made no sense for him to lose all his heat to a champion from another territory who'd basically beat him and leave. So, Sue, Ross and I decided I'd get to work with Bockwinkel instead. This was fine with me, as it was a childhood dream come true for me to work with the world champion on the big Stampede Supercard. In the weeks leading up to my big match with Bockwinkel, I was filled with nervous anticipation. On the night with no parking on the Stampede grounds, I simply walked over to the venue from home with Julie, Michelle, and Wilk. I'd come in late from the previous night's road trip, having celebrated my 24th birthday in the van, with nobody making any fuss. I'd had to be up by 5.30 a.m. to be in the Stampede Parade, where I sat between Bruce and Keith, along with Owen and in Georgia, in an open convertible waving at people lining the streets on an unusually hot morning. Most of the day was taken up with media events, where my father proudly introduced me and announced that I'd be taking on the world champion. By the time I'd carried my bag and Stu's famous black and red ring robe up the steep steps of Scotsman's Hill, the temperature had soared well into the 90s. I stood at the top soaked in sweat and smiling at the view of Stampede Park as a rush of memories came back to me. The whole carnival scene of swirling neon took on a magical feeling as I told myself it was time to live a dream. I had a lot on my mind as I descended the steps toward the pass gate. At the bottom, suddenly Julie was really upset with me, she said, because I was walking too far ahead of her. I was thinking, please, not now. Before I knew it, she'd pulled off her promise ring, thrown it past me and stormed off, Michelle behind her. Wilk and I looked at each other dumbfounded as I scanned the area trying to find the ring. I knew Julie would later be upset with herself for acting this way, she always was. With people wandering all around me, I took note of the precise area. I'd have to look for the ring after the show. The dressing room reeked of bullshit from some of the finest beef in the world, and I don't mean the wrestlers. The big Brahma Bulls were stabled in the same building as us for the stampede. Heinrich Kaiser, a German promoter, was there scouting new talent to work for him in September. Stuffy and autocratic with neatly trimmed silver hair and thick tortoiseshell glasses, Kaiser sported the biggest diamond ring I've ever seen. Tom was talking over his title match with Keith. Davy Boy looked like he was ready to burst into tears, crushed to find that he was wrestling a pal of Bruce's whom Bruce had dubbed Mandingo the Wildman of Borneo. He was barely a wrestler at all and came into the ring devouring raw beef kidneys. Bruce chatted with Jockham, a friend he'd met in Hanover. Six feet tall and wiry with long, dark hair and a squared-off beard, Jockham bore a distinct resemblance to a Civil War general. His profession was no less colorful. He was a homicide detective who happened to be a big wrestling fan. He had a deceptively friendly and unimposing face, which, I suspected, came in handy for a cop. Jockham was on vacation, but Bruce was about to put him to work. Since Sandy's departure, Bruce had become obsessed with trying to recreate another heel ref. It didn't matter to him that Jockham had no ring experience whatsoever. He called him Jurgen Himmler, and just liked that the eager and willing fan was now a heel referee. I smiled on seeing the midgets again. Sky Lolo, now 65, was surely the greatest midget wrestler of all time. He stood thigh high as I shook his hand, his stubby fingers like tiny sausages. Sky's face was that of a baby combined with an old man. He looked exactly like he did when I was a kid. When I was about five years old, my dad stopped on the way to the matches to pick the midgets up at the Royal Hotel. They climbed into the backseat of the big limo where Dean and I were sitting. I asked an ugly guy called Little Irish Jackie whether he wanted to wrestle me. He quickly clamped his short fat fingers on my knee really hard, and I cried out. Dean slipped on a friendly headlock, which only got Irish Jackie matter. Jamaica Kid, a black midget, nudged me with his knee to try Jackie one more time while Sky Low Low and Little Beaver laughed their heads off. Luthez, a six-time NWA world champ, was standing talking to Nick Bockwinkle. Thez was 65 too and looked great, though his black hair was thinning and his cauliflower ears were the size of doorknobs. He was the special guest ref for the world title match. Bockwinkle, more than 20 years older than I was, looked smooth and athletic just lacing his boots up. I sat down with him to give him the outline of the match. We'd basically do a 60-minute draw or Broadway, with Foley sneaking out in the dying seconds and ringing the bell with his steel-tipped cane, costing me the world title. The next week Nick and I would come back for a rematch with a 90-minute time limit. Nick said fine. 
the crowd was surprisingly vocal considering the suffocating heat, and the fact that there had been 11 matches ahead of us. I was more than grateful for the thunderous ovation they gave me when I came out wearing my father's robe. I'd given him the outline, but as a bona fide world champ, Nick called the match. A champion never allowed a greenhorn to take control. To a champion, the belt was more than real. With his reputation at stake, he needed to always be braced to protect and defend it at all times during a match, whatever the cost. Things can happen. Wrestling legend had it that Bruno Sammartino tossed Buddy Rogers over his shoulder in an upside-down bear hug only to have them ring the bell on Rogers, screwing him out of the title. Of course, Bruno always professed that Rogers was in on it, but even to this day, I'm not sure. After 58 minutes I was sunken deep with an abdominal stretch, with no chance that Nick could reach the ropes. Every fan was standing, and it didn't hit them at first when JR rang the bell, ending the match. When JR entered the ring, Fez peeled off his striped ref's shirt, knocking JR on his ass with a nice elbow smash for the easy pop. In the dressing room I dripped a huge puddle of sweat, praying I'd have enough energy to do it all again the next night in Edmonton. Julie was there with Wilk to walk me home. We could figure her out. I was too tired to be mad and just wanted to go home. When we got to where she'd thrown the ring away, she frantically clawed through the grass. I was amazed to see a glint in the grass and nonchalantly bent to pick the ring up. I actually wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it, and didn't mention that I'd found it. But Julie was so depressed on the rest of the way home I finally handed it back to her. I made the drive up to Edmonton the next day with Davy Boy and went another full hour in the ring with Bockwinkle. Luthez asked whether he could ride back with us, and we had a long and fascinating talk. He told me that the business was a total shoot until about 1925, at a time when Jack Dempsey was knocking everyone out in a couple of rounds and Babe Ruth was smashing the home run record in baseball, the average world title match often lasted five or six hours and ended in a stalemate. Ed Strangler Lewis, Thez's mentor, was impossible to beat, so he eventually worked a title loss just to pump some new blood into the business and make a nice payoff, and that was when it had all changed. Lou told me that every wrestler on a card in those days knew how to wrestle. The difference in the business was that the wrestlers always had respect for each other based on their actual wrestling ability and toughness but nowadays the fans, promoters and too many of the wrestlers didn't even care about that. By the time we hit Calgary at around 4 in the morning I was toast yet totally full of excitement. Then a car was coming at us, hard. In order to avert a broadside collision, I slammed on the brakes, missing the other car by inches. By the time we pulled up to a red light, there were six guys drunkenly sneering at us. Davy called out, where'd you fucking learn to drive? That was all it took. In seconds Davy and I were out of the car teaching these drunks a lesson. As we sped away afterwards, I felt a thump under the back left tire and hoped I hadn't driven over somebody's leg. I apologized to Lou, but he wouldn't hear it. Instead he told me he was sorry for not helping us. Sorry, boys. These days I fight with my head, not my fists. Throughout the rest of the summer of 1981, I had some fantastic bloody brawls with Schultz, who was kind enough to take me under his wing and teach me all he could about heel psychology. Schultz would barely stagger back to the dressing room, his blonde hair streaked red, clutching the belt in victory, leaving me standing in the ring, having lost yet again, with every fan in the building believing I was the rightful champion. I was overstrong thanks to Schultz. Mr. Shima wanted me in Japan again, with dynamite, for six weeks starting the next January. And Kaiser, the German promoter, was so impressed with my matches with Bockwinkel that he booked me, Big Jim Neidhart and Adrian Street, a 5'6", stocky, bleached blonde wrestler who worked a fag gimmick with his valet girlfriend Linda, to work a 60-day tournament in the fall for US $1,000 per week. Tom told me he was going to head home to England in November and said he'd call Max Crabtree, the UK promoter, and book us there after Germany, the money wasn't great in England, but we could bring Julie and Michelle with us. As the summer of 1981 came to a close, I recall a bunch of us working out in Stu's basement after the usual Sunday booking meeting. Jim was dripping with sweat. Tom and Davey were lifting really heavy now. Tom could easily bench press 450 pounds, and little Davey, who was spotting him, wasn't little anymore. With the help of steroids he'd gained 25 pounds in a few months and was now more than 200 pounds. Stu brought Carl Moffat down to the basement, a bald-headed biker who jumped out of the crowd to attack Adrian Street at one of the matches a while back. Stu reminded me of an old lion bringing a rabbit to his cubs to practice on. Carl wanted to break into the business. Stu left to take a phone call and Jim eagerly clamped Moffat in a headlock, rolled up against the wall and nearly pulled his screaming head right off his shoulders. After we'd had our fun, Carl crawled out of there, and I remember thinking on that particular afternoon, we were all happy. 
there were decent crowds that gave the illusion that business was good despite the fact that the overhead was so high there was no profit. Still, there was a sense that things would get better. Bruce had what he always wanted, control of the book. Everyone was paired off. Tom was in love. Diana was head over heels for Davy. Even Jim and Ellie were close. As for me, I was about to see the world. With Julie by my side. Julie and I flew to Hanover along with Jim, Ellie, and 10-month-old baby Jenny in October. Jockin, the steely homicide detective with a big heart, met us when we landed. He'd fallen in love with Canada, Stampede Wrestling and the Hart family and he had gone to great lengths to make arrangements to look after us. He set the night arts up in the apartment of a police informant who'd had some trouble with the law and was now stuck in a Hungarian jail cell. Julie and I would stay with Jockham and his wife, Heidi, and their three-year-old son, Dennis. As Jockham drove us down cobblestone streets on the way to their apartment, he proudly pointed out stoic cathedrals and beautifully restored buildings. I was surprised to learn that much of Hanover had been destroyed during the Second World War, the unforgettable evidence of artillery was engraved in pockmarked viaducts. As we passed the soccer stadium, there were posters up promoting everything from rock concerts to wrestling. Jockham pointed out the chutes and flats, where a huge circus tent was erected. Tucked neatly in the rear were several small trailers where some of the wrestlers lived. Out front, a billboard boldly announced, Catchwell Cup. Every night for the next six weeks we would work in that tent, and I was anxious to show the German fans what I could do. On the first night of the tournament Heinrich Kaiser directed us to his right-hand man, Peter William, who had white hair and was built like a stork. He smiled, clicked his heels together and said, Nice to meet you, gentlemen. How is your brother Smith? He told us how, when Smith had been in Germany, all the wrestlers would parade out at the beginning of the show, marching around the ring and then climbing into it to the sound of marching music. It was quite amusing, he said. Sometimes Smitty would walk backward, or hop on one leg, or wore his boots on the wrong feet. The best one was the time he did Charlie Chaplin. He brushed his hair to one side, trimmed his mustache, stuffed a ball of socks down the front of his trunks, and goose-stepped to the ring, complete with a one-arm salute. We all had such a laugh. He wasn't smiling when he said it, and I took it as a warning. The wrestlers came from all over the world, Russians, Brits, Frenchmen, Spaniards, Africans, Japanese, Americans. The top babyface in the tournament was a German named Axel Dieter. He looked about 60 years old, with a face like an axe, and wore his stringy hair in a comb-over. It occurred to me that all the German wrestlers were at least 50 years old, while all the guys they'd be beating every night were the young stars from everywhere else. After the parade I watched one match after another. The old men wrestled in a slow, stiff style that was almost comical, yet the German fans whistled and cheered enthusiastically. The more I watched, the more I saw how easy it would be to impress these fans with how well I could work. On that first night in Germany, I was wrestling Bob de la Serra, a 30-year-old French-Canadian who worked under a mask as UFO. He was an established star, and my job was to put him over. I entered the ring to a German pop song, which signaled to the fans that I was a babyface. UFO was eager to work, and we gave them a splendid all-time match with him calling all sorts of high-flying drop kicks and slick roll-ups before catching a quick fall on me. The crowd was easy to please, typical of wrestling fans all over Germany. After intermission on the first night, they posted the next night's matchups on the billboard. Jim was working, but I was off, and that became the pattern. I'd made a mistake having a good match that first night, the old German wrestlers couldn't follow it. I was considered a threat to the old established order, so the promoters made it clear, both to the fans and to me, that I wasn't going to contend. After that I rarely worked, and when I did, I was disposed of in short matches by jobbers. Big Jim, on the other hand, was being built as a top hill so that he could eventually be thumped by Axel. He worked hard every night, usually going a minimum of four rounds. Jim couldn't understand why I was unhappy about not working, since my pay was the same either way. But I was thinking of the future, and I was sure that I wouldn't be invited back the next year. I liked Germany, the people, the food, the open-mindedness. Jockham arranged for Jim and me to have the use of a cheap car, so every day we went to the Coed Sport Fitness Centrum, where we sweated out the previous night's alcohol. When we showered, hard-bodied froyleins with unshaven armpits would eagerly soap our backs. We'd return the favor, laughing and giggling like little kids. After a few days it didn't seem unusual to us anymore. Every night after the show, Jockham took Jim and me to sex clubs, lesbian bars and brothels where he conducted undercover police work. I imagined myself as some sort of a shadowy player in a world of international intrigue, which served to distract me from my bruised ego. I plopped down on a stool with a beer in front of me, always the best and always compliments of the owners, busy talking to Jockham. 
On many of these outings, Jim seemed lost in thought, having learned that Ellie was pregnant again. Eventually Jockham would give us a nod, time to move on to another club. By 3 a.m., I was drinking apple schnapps in the best brothel in Hanover, debating the differences between American and German culture with the owner. I couldn't get over the fact that prostitution was legal in Germany. Then the proprietor offered Jim and me the girls of our choice, compliments of the house. Jim declined with a sheepish look, saying, um, I'm married. To Brett's sister. And what about you? The owner smiled at me. I said, my girlfriend is here. Girlfriends, they do not count. Before I knew it I was being led through six floors of hallways, trying to choose among at least 300 good-looking girls, wearing everything from lingerie to leather. I kept reminding myself that I wasn't married, and a chance like this wasn't likely to come again, and besides, who would know? And then I thought of Julie. Perhaps it was the booze, or the fact that I couldn't begin to pick just one girl. Maybe some other time, I said. I resigned myself to my role as a jobber and actually had some good matches. As a special treat one night, I rode in an unmarked police cruiser with Jockham while he worked. A call came in over the radio that shots had been fired, and I ended up hunched down in the car while Jockham and his partner chased a killer, who they eventually caught hiding in a tree. I returned to the apartment drunk, with visions of sex and violence spinning in my head. I crawled quietly into the little bed that Jockham had provided, one for me and one for Julie, when she suddenly slammed her fist hard into my face. In whispered shouts, she tore into me. I can smell perfume on you a mile away. It's just some soap on a rope that I borrowed from this Spanish wrestler. I've been out with Jockham all night chasing killers. It occurred to me, even as I said it, that as excuses go, it was a pretty strange line. Even stranger because it was true. Julie gave me the cold shoulder for several days. As the weeks went by it really began to bother me that Julie kept accusing me of something I didn't do, to the point that sometimes I wished I had. Of course it never occurred to me to go home to her right after the matches. Meanwhile, Jim and Ellie had alienated everyone at their apartment complex with ear-shattering shouting matches. On the final day of the tour I stopped by Adrian Street's trailer and met a well-dressed, stern-looking man who introduced himself as Adrian's father. He had been one of the British Army's most highly decorated heroes during the Second World War and had escaped twice from his Japanese captors. I sat lacing my boots up in the dressing tent when the flap opened, and in stumbled a dazed German wrestler named Dahlberg. There was blood pouring out of his mouth and spilling down his chin, and he was holding three teeth in his open hand. My music played and minutes later I was in the ring with adorable Adrian Street riding me around like a pony and spanking me on the ass while the crowd roared with laughter. At least I still have my teeth. Naturally, Axel Dieter won the tournament and was bedecked in wreaths of flowers and awarded a big silver cup. Julie and I were off to England, where Tom and Michelle were waiting for us. We stayed with Davy's mom and dad in the small town of Goulburn, in the North Country, not far from Wigan, renowned within wrestling circles for its shooters. Tom and Michelle were staying at Tom's parents' place, about a minute's walk down the street. Davy's parents were in their fifties. Sid was handsome, with jet black hair and a thin mustache. Joyce was a sturdy woman who didn't say a lot. Davy had an older brother, Terence, who no longer lived at home, and two young sisters. Joanne looked like Davy, and Tracy was a frail but adorable blonde born with brain cancer who'd gone through years of painful surgeries that left her mentally challenged. She always wore a big, bright smile. Julie and Michelle had plenty to catch up on, which was just as well, since Tom and I had a full calendar of bookings. Tom had got me a guarantee of U.S. dollar five hundred a week which was good by British wrestling standards. Max Crabtree, the promoter, was the cleverest of the three Crabtree brothers who controlled wrestling in the UK. The boys thought of Max as a penny pincher who talked out of both sides of his mouth, a tendency common to wrestling promoters, although he was fair and honest with me. I had a hunch that, like my dad, Max probably wasn't making as much as the boys imagined, but nobody argued that he didn't have a brilliant mind for business. Running five or six different shows a night all over the UK, he managed to pack the halls even though he was running some of the sorriest-looking wrestlers to ever suit up, although that's not to say that there weren't some great British wrestlers. Max and his smaller brother, Brian, who was his MC, had at one time been workers, but it was the oldest brother, Shirley Big Daddy Crabtree, who was the biggest attraction in Great Britain. He was a year older than Max, had a 65-inch chest and weighed more than 500 pounds. His white hair poked out under a red, white and blue top hat. He reminded me of a friendly polar bear. One of his biggest fans was Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Big Daddy's finishing move was to fall backward and crush his opponent flat. Few men could handle the impact, but all it took was for Max to wave a few extra quid in a wrestler's face, and he put his life on the line. 
nobody gave a wank about who was winning or losing. If anything, the Brits preferred to wrestle first so they could dash back home, since most of them had day jobs. There were silly gimmicks everywhere in the dressing room and a variety of accents, from Cockney to Yorkshire, and all the wrestlers, from 16 to 60, spoke English rhyming slang fluently. There was Steve Logan, a small, 16-year-old kid. Another guy, a bit older but just as slender, plomped around dressed up as a firefighter, dragging a four-foot length of fire hose. A short East Indian called the Prince was easily as hairy as a gorilla. Tarzan Johnny Hunter, a big bodybuilder, wore a leopard skin singlet. Then there was strongman Alan Dennison, a kind, middle-aged, bald-headed wrestler wearing silver armbands. Dennison had a nice physique for his age, but his strongman bit was all show. There was Mick McManus, a small, crusty wrestler who had to be 60 years old, the greatest villain of UK wrestling, whom the boys still tiptoed around. King Kong Kirk stood 6 foot 4 and 350 pounds, with a shaved head and one ugly mug. I remembered him briefly working for my dad in the early 1970s. King Kong was my opponent the first night. Max told me I would work as the blue eye, as the Brits called a babyface, and I was to put him over in five rounds. Tom was working with none other than Mark Rollerball Rocco, considered one of the best grafters, or workers, in Britain at the time. He was small and dapper with dark hair and a trim mustache. At 30, Rollerball was a second-generation heel, as much loved by his peers for his hard work in the ring as for his knack for telling colossal bullshit stories. The British wrestling style was gymnastic and choreographed, and the rules were a bit like boxing. If a wrestler was down, his opponent had to back off while the referee gave him a 10 count. I went out wearing my silly cowboy hat to an enthusiastic cheer. Kirk stood sneering in the middle of the ring, which was big and bouncy and surrounded by old-time fans, at-pin types. Kirk turned out to be a great worker and bump taker, and when he collapsed on top of me he was as light, as if he'd covered me with a blanket. King Kong loved the match and so did Max, who booked me to work with Tom in his hometown the next night. The following morning at Tom's place, I was introduced to his mentor, Ted Betley. It was strange to think that this short, balding, soft-spoken old farmer in a tweed coat was tough as nails. And Tom acted like a choir boy around him, no swearing, no smoking and no boozing. In the packed hall that night in Warrington, I was whipping forearm smashes across Dynamite's lower back. With every blow the crowd grew more incensed, and when I forgot to break for the count, the crowd wanted my head. I was black-hatted cowboy Bret Hart the batty. Tom was taking such high back drops that I feared his feet would hit the ring lights overhead. I knew this match meant the world to him. He wanted to show what he could do to the other wrestlers, his old mates, friends who had ridiculed his choice of career, and especially his old mentor, Ted Bentley, all of whom were looking on from the stands. Tom's dad was also there, small and hard, like his son. We weren't giving the crowd the usual flips and rolls, we were giving each other an absolute physical thrashing. Dynamite jammed his thumb up his nose and blood poured smearing the lower half of his face. When I finally went for my side backbreaker, he kicked his legs up and turned a complete circle in the air, landing on his feet in perfect position to pile drive me. I lay flat on my back and stared up at the ring lights, happy to have had a great match. The thought disappeared when the lights were blocked by the flying body of Dynamite, who had launched himself off the top turnbuckle and crashed head to head with me. The crowd screamed as I twisted in pretend agony. I never felt a thing. Dynamite hooked my leg for the one, two, three, when we returned to the dressing room, the boys were in awe. Later Tom pulled me aside and told me that Max was so thrilled that he added me to the last card ever at King's Hall at Bellevue Stadium in Manchester to work with Marty Jones, the Lancashire Lion. It's like Madison Square Garden. It's at wrestling and boxing since forever, and they're tearing the building down, Tom said. I heard later that many of the boys approached Max wanting to take my place on the bill, even offering to work for free, but Max stood by me. I think the fan in him wanted to see the cowboy tangle with the lion. King's Hall was packed to overflowing with 7,500 enthusiastic fans. All the wrestling legends of the past came by for one last visit. The mood in the dressing room was melancholy as wrestlers pieced together the last bouts they'd ever have in that historic old building. All the Brits had fond memories of the place, as did all the fans, and when the night was over things wouldn't be the same for wrestling in England. Marty and I worked a hard, solid match in which the crafty Brit beat me with a fancy double roll-up. I'm still honored to have worked that final show. Julie and I took the train to Liverpool to see the Cavern Club, where the Beatles first played. It wasn't much more than a hole in the wall selling souvenirs. On the train back, she brought up the whole thing about being unfaithful in Germany again and said that when we returned home we should go our separate ways. I was angry and hurt that she'd put me through all this again, 
so I decided to take her at her word and accept that she was really leaving this time. I was single again. Royal Albert Hall. I couldn't help but whistle a day in the life. I was supposed to put Pat Roach over, who was a strict blue eye in England. He was awfully big, but I said I'd do all that I could. Tom grabbed me just before the match and took me upstairs where there were stacks of long tables and chairs piled up next to a small janitor's room. He nodded toward the door. Open it. When I did, I saw a girl, slightly older than I was, with dirty blonde hair, and a slim but busty figure in a black leather miniskirt. This him? She asked coyly. Tom had already disappeared. The girl tugged me inside, pushed the door shut and fumbled with my zipper in the dark. Before I could stop myself things were already out of hand. Now I know how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall. I could hear Tom laughing in the distance. In the ring I hit Pat Roach with everything I had, gouging his eyes, wailing away on him with a barrage of punches and kicks. Every time I pounded him down, he jumped back up in his boxer's stance, and we'd have to start building the match all over again. Oddly, I thought how it wasn't a whole lot different from how I kept pulling myself back up, again and again, to start all over with Julie. And it was the fact that many British houses had no central heating that may well have saved me and Julie. Just before we were to go home, England was hit with the worst winter snowstorm of the century, but there was no army of snowplows like we had back home. It was 25 below zero we'd go to bed not talking to each other, wearing all our clothes, including our coats. Even in the midst of breaking up we saw the humor, waking up in each other's arms, stuck together like icicles. We just sort of made up. When we finished up with Max, I took Julie to London for a few days, bought her a new winter coat, and lots of new clothes. She chose trendy punk styles and Doc Martens boots, and I hoped it would make her happy to show Michelle what I'd bought for her. In the evening, we rode to the theatre in a shiny black London cab and found Avita nothing short of awe-inspiring. Afterwards we ate a pricey seafood restaurant across the street, sucking down raw oysters on the half-shell and sipping shark fin soup. Finally, Julie poured out how sorry she was. Although the royal wedding of Charles and Diana inspired young couples everywhere,